to expect the same service from raw and undisciplined recruits as from veteran soldiers is to expect what never did and perhaps never will happen. Men who are familiarized to danger meet it without shrinking. Whereas troops unused to service often apprehend danger where no danger is. In the years of the American Revolution, General George Washington's Continental Army fights bravely and indeed valiantly for independence from Great Britain. But for all their fighting spirit, with the loss of New York City in 1776 and Philadelphia the following year, it soon becomes clear that a crucial piece is missing from the Patriots' battlefront. When Washington sees the power and mobility of horse-mounted soldiers and officers, he is merely reminded of tactics that have, to that point, been employed for centuries. Indeed, the shock and awe of the mobile, armored troop continues to be utilized on the battlefield, even today, as the horse is gradually replaced by the automobile, the tank, and defense aircraft. While cavalry and dragoons have been in use in Europe and Asia for hundreds of years, it is the American Revolution that serves as the birthplace and the start of an evolutionary journey for the United States Cavalry. The time is now near at hand, which must probably determine whether Americans are to be free men or slaves, whether they are to have any property they can call their own, whether their houses and farms are to be pillaged and destroyed, and themselves consigned to a state of wretchedness from which no human efforts will deliver them. The fate of unborn millions will now depend, under God, on the courage and conduct of this army. Our cruel and unrelenting enemy leaves us only the choice of brave resistance or the most abject submission. We have, therefore, to resolve to conquer or die. On April 14, 1775, General Thomas Gage, Commander-in-Chief of the British Army in North America, receives instructions to disarm and arrest American revolutionaries, their leaders, and militiamen. Just two months previous, Britain had declared Massachusetts in a state of rebellion. Commanding British regulars from Boston, Gage sends 700 soldiers to Concord in an effort to seize the stockpiled ammunition and weapons from the colonial militia. This is the night of April 18, 1775, which will be made famous by the ride of Paul Revere. Revere and other men on horseback race across the Massachusetts countryside through the night, warning citizens and militia alike of the impending British attack. As the morning of April 19th comes, 77 Minutemen attempt to defend Concord's village green from the British, but their ranks are thin, and the British, killing several Minutemen, move through this initial line into Concord proper. There, the British find a force of 500 Minutemen and are forced to retreat to Boston. The road back to their base of operations is fraught with volley fire at every turn as the British are attacked by thousands of militiamen from various villages along the route. The message to both sides was clear. The war was on. In the first year of the American Revolution, the Colonials fight bravely, using tactics wholly unfamiliar to the British Redcoats, and making the most of their intricate knowledge of the land they had come to call their home. However, by the following year, it becomes apparent to General Washington that resources and tactics have provided Britain with a certain edge on the battlefield. While there were a few mounted regiments they were not nearly enough to match forces with the British Dragoons. In their History of the Armor Cavalry, published in 1969, Mary Lee Stubbs, 
and Stanley Russell Connor encapsulate the evolution of the United States Cavalry that began with the American Revolution. At the time of the American Revolution, the term cavalry was applied to that branch of the military service whose members served and fought on horseback. The word horse was used about as often and meant essentially the same thing. By the 18th century, specialization had developed sufficiently in cavalry to bring forth three distinctive types of mounted commands, varying in mission, armament, and weight of horses. The heavy cavalry, used primarily for shock effect in battle. The light cavalry, designed for reconnaissance, screening missions, and messenger service. And the dragoons, trained to fight both on foot and on horseback. In actual practice, these distinctions were far from precise, and they tended to decrease in importance in the 19th century. In North America, the traditional cavalryman has ever been the light dragoon, a soldier trained and equipped to fight mounted or dismounted, to perform screening and reconnaissance, and to act as a scout or a messenger. Never was the need for a skilled cavalry more apparent than at the Battle of White Plains on October 18, 1776. After British General William Howe is driven from Boston in March, Howe and his men set up a base in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and set their sights on capturing colonist-controlled New York City. After intelligence gathering missions have confirmed to Washington that British troops have begun taking positions throughout what is now New York State and the Hudson River Valley, the general is sure that Howe and his redcoats are planning an attack on White Plains, home to a Continental Army supply depot. Washington immediately orders reinforcements, but they wouldn't be enough to save White Plains or New York City. General Washington selected a position near White Plains, fortified it by two lines of entrenchments and there awaited Howe's attack. The trenches were on slightly rising ground, the left protected by swampy ground and the right resting on the Bronx River. Beyond the right was a piece of high ground called Chatterton's Hill, which commanded the plain over which Howe would have to advance. It was occupied by Hazlitt's Delaware Regiment with two guns of Captain Alexander Hamilton's battery and supported by McDougall's brigade, in all about 1,600 men. Although Howe outnumbered Washington, he deemed it unwise to attack the main position until he had gained possession of Chatterton's Hill. He therefore sent Leslie with his own brigade and three regiments of Hessians, about 4,000 men in all, to dislodge Hazlitt. They forded the Bronx and advanced up the hill, their attack preceded by a sharp artillery fire from 13 guns posted on the east side of the Bronx River. Such effective resistance was made by two excellent regiments in McDougal's brigade and by Hamilton's two guns that the first attack failed. Later, it was renewed in front while Rail, with one of his Hessian regiments, made his way around Hazlitt's right flank. And this attack succeeded. McDougal retreated bringing off the guns and joining Washington's main position. The chief object of Howe's maneuver, to get in rear of Washington, and by occupying a line from Long Island Sound to the Hudson to surround him and cut off his communications with New England, had thus failed. He had, nevertheless, succeeded in dividing Washington's small force into three bodies, one in New Jersey, at or near Fort Lee, one on Manhattan Island, at or near Fort Washington, and the third at North Castle. The main body at North Castle and the most important post at Fort Washington were 25 miles apart, and how was between them. In December of 1776, the Second Continental Light Dragoons are commissioned by the Continental Army. The regiment, nicknamed Sheldon's Horse, after Colonel Elisha Sheldon, 
who initially commands the militiamen, from which the dragoons are formed, consisted of six units, two companies of light cavalry, and five troops from Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. A major in the light dragoons, Benjamin Talmadge, will later become Washington's chief intelligence officer and organizer of the famous Culper Spy Ring, providing reconnaissance of British actions in New York. The Light Dragoons soon become known as Washington's Eyes, and through their efforts on the battlefield and their espionage, they prove to Washington, as well as the Continental Congress, the usefulness of a more intensive unit of mounted officers and infantrymen. On the 14th of March, 1777, Congress approved Washington's regimental organization for the Light Dragoons. It provided three field officers, a staff, and six troops for each regiment. Each troop contained three officers, six non-commissioned officers, a trumpeter, and 34 privates. One of the sergeants specialized in logistics, and two privates, an armorer and a farrier, received higher pay. The farrier provided rudimentary veterinary care and shod the horses. The staff was similar to an infantry regiment's, with the addition of a riding instructor and a saddler to keep leather gear in repair. Four supernumeraries were cadets, undergoing training who served the colonel as messengers. The Continental Light Dragoon Regiment was comparable to the British version, but it provided more specialists on both the troop and regimental level to allow greater dispersion on reconnaissance missions. The problems involved in procuring the horses and the special cavalry weapons and equipment, in training the horses for combat, and in developing high standards of individual skill contributed to the long periods needed to organize these regiments. While the act of Congress was a step forward in winning the war, the challenges faced by the formation of the new units proved daunting. To assist in recruiting and training the new dragoons, the United States turns to Count Casimir Pulaski, a Polish soldier who had by that point led successful campaigns in Russia, Austria, and Prussia. Recommended by Benjamin Franklin, who urged Washington to accept Pulaski into the volunteer army, Pulaski traveled to America in the summer of 1777. It would be several months before Pulaski would receive his rank, but on September 11th, 1777, before Congress approved his admission into the Continental Army, Pulaski and Washington successfully fought off British troops at the Battle of Brandywine. The quick tactical work and leadership of Pulaski not only prevented a calamitous continental defeat, but saved Washington's life. With his reputation among Americans secured, Washington makes Pulaski a brigadier general only four days later, and in the winter of 1777 through 1778, Pulaski trains the new corps of Continental Light Dragoons at Trenton, New Jersey. Friction between Pulaski and some American officers leads to Pulaski's resignation of that post. But in 1778, Pulaski is authorized to form his own corps, and the training and discipline imparted to the Light Dragoons have affirmed many historians' assertion that Pulaski is the father of the American cavalry. The Dragoons fight bravely in dozens of skirmishes throughout the American Revolution, but perhaps the most notable was the Battle of Cowpens in South Carolina on January 17, 1781. The Continental soldiers, led by Brigadier General Daniel Morgan, with support from Colonel William Washington's 1st and 3rd Continental Light Dragoons, successfully defeat the British in a battle that sees the infantry making use of the hilly terrain as cover for musket volleys, as the Dragoons provided cover as the soldiers changed positions. The Battle of Cowpens ultimately becomes the linchpin in the American effort to retake South Carolina from the British.